I would like to uh, invite on the behalf of the saints in Roselle, not Wayne, Roselle, the uh, saints of God to come to their annual conference in Roselle, New Jersey. They have a conference coming up two weeks from yesterday. And I'm sure they would love to have you. Brother Saeed reminded us of iPod just earlier. It's the days of the I generation. I tell my kids and the young people, the only thing I'm acquainted with is ice cream and IHOP. <laughs> they can be acquainted with iPod. I'm acquainted with ice cream and IHOP. But it's unfortunate thing that it's a generation of the I. And believe it or not, there is a subtle message that's being related to mankind that is I, myself, and me. We might uh, uh, accept certain things and say there is value in them, there is something unique about them, they are helpful, they are tools given to us, they are helpful, but sometimes it's also good for us to examine the source and what is the message that is related to the I generation? It is the I, myself, and me. And that these three elements are totally contrary to the person of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus, it says, he pleased not himself. There was nothing in this blessed man, although he is God himself, although he is the creator of all things, he have every right to do everything to his own pleasure. As God, it says in Rome in Revelation chapter 4, when they were surrounding him and they are declaring that he is worthy of riches and dominion and greatness, he says, For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure were they created. So, as a blessed God, he has every right to delight in things that he creates. But as a blessed man, he was not acquainted with the I generation. It was not that he pleased not himself. But his object and desire was to please his blessed God. I look to the Lord of what the Lord might have for us. And I have to say that sometimes when you come after a remembrance meeting, it warms my heart just to think of him. So the saints have to forgive me about the gates. And I trust that the brethren will have plenty of time, which we have. We are exhorted to redeem the times because the days are evil. And the redemption requires sacrifice, right? When the Lord redeemed our souls, he was sacrificed. And when we need to redeem our time, because the excuse we always give is that there is no time. There is no time. Everybody is so busy. No time. And the scripture comes and it says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. So if the Apostle Paul will encourage us to redeem the time, then it requires sacrifice. And if it requires sacrifice, then you and I have to be able to set time aside to delight ourselves in this blessed, wonderful Savior we have, the Lord Jesus. So I want to talk about his greatness. I want to talk about his person. I want to talk about where he is right now. I want to talk about him occupying the throne. And I want to talk about him in a coming day. When everything will be set right. And we are ushered into new creation. So turn with me please. I want to read three portions. One in the Old Testament. The second one in the middle of the Old Testament. And then the last one in the last book of the New Testament. Or of the, of the Bible. So the first one in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Second Chronicles, you see, I was thinking of, thank you. Second Chronicles chapter 9, and beginning from verse 17. And it says over there, and the king made a great throne of ivory, and overlaid it with pure gold. And the throne had six steps with a footstool 
a gold fastened to the throne. And there were arms on each side at the place of the seat. And two lions stood beside the arms. And twelve lions stood there on the one side, on, on the other, upon the six steps. There was not like made in any kingdom. I want to highlight that verse. There was not like made in any kingdom. The book of Isaiah, chapter 6. And before I go to chapter 6, I just want to read one verse from chapter 1. And that's verse 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Isaiah chapter 6. In the king, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphims, each, had one, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me. And the last reading, by the help of the Lord, is from the book of Revelation, chapter 21. The book of Revelation, chapter 21. And beginning from verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God. Out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. Amen. The orderly time that the minister should be finished by. I take it very seriously when you say take your time. Because it might go. It might go. But I'm going to take it. We'll see, we'll plan for 1.30. And, uh, you know, give me one of these, Brother side, and I'll sit down. But there's no greater occupation for the saints of God other than the person of Christ. We might be able to talk about gates and learn tremendous and profound lessons from them. About shepherding care, about evangelism. About uh, the old past that we are exhorted to walk into. We can learn tremendous truth about the dung gate. That all the things that we have obtained of Christ is such a 
great gain for us as saints that everything else is only dung in comparison to the person of the Lord Jesus. We might encourage one another that we have the Spirit of God indwelling in us. It's like we said yesterday that in John 14, 15 and 16, we see that divine persons are occupied in sending the Spirit of God. In chapter 14, the Father sends the Spirit of God and He will guide us into all things. In chapter 15, the Son sends the Spirit of God so that He can abide in us. And in chapter 16, the Spirit of truth or the Spirit of God Himself, He comes to dwell so that He can glorify Christ. And the reason that I want to start from where the Spirit of God does in John 16, that He shall glorify me. And I want to talk about the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are great men in the scripture, and we can rest assured that God raised these godly men and these godly sisters so that each one of them can present us with a feature that speaks of Christ Jesus. And they all come short. You know what? It was said that mo the most perfect type of Christ might be the material of the ark. Because we never read of any weakness found in the ark. There is the pure gold that speaks of divinity. And there is the acacia wood that speaks about his perfect humanity. We never read of any weakness found in the ark. That's why we say that the perfect type or the closest type of the Lord Jesus is the ark himself. And this is why when the ark rested in the book of Chronicles, we don't read that there was the rod of Aaron. We don't read that there was the pot, but we read that the only two things or the only one thing that was left in the ark in the book of Chronicles when the ark rested was what? Was the two tables about the commandments of God. So now the ark rested and the only thing that is still in the ark was these two tables. What is it? What is God trying to teach me as a type of the Lord Jesus? Brethren, the only thing that will ever remain in heaven... Not no more the priestly uh, service of Christ to help the saints of God, to support the saints of God, right? Right now we need much help, believe me. We need much help. And because we need much help, God has made Christ Jesus as our great high priest. What? He helps us, the scripture says, with our what? Infirmities. You and I have infirmities in this world. And the only way we can go ahead with it is when we depend on our great high priest. So when the ark rests, when God rests with everything he has done, there is no more need for the rod of Aaron, right? There's no more need for it. Because I don't need anybody now to sustain me in the wilderness or to help me with my infirmities. Because when we reach home, we can rest assured, brethren, there shall be no more infirmities. The other thing that was not in the ark was the pot of manna. Just to remember in the ark there were three. The Aaron rod, the pot of manna, and the two tables of stone. But even when the ark crested, there was no more the pot of manna. The manna was given, there is different food. And you know what, brethren, believe it or not. When people tell me, why do you like food? They tell me that. Why do I like food? Because I tell them, God loves food. God, from the beginning of the pages of Genesis all the way to Revelation, has given the people of God different food for different occasions. He has given them every herb to eat. He has given them the Passover lamb. He has given them the manna. He has given them the corn of the land. He has given them the Lord Jesus as the true food for the soul. But the manna was a food to sustain us in the wilderness. So because we are no longer in the wilderness when we reach home, then the manna is absent. So the only thing is left is the two tables. What is it? What is about the two tables that is in the heart or in the middle of the ark that remains eternally when the ark rested? By way of type, of course. Is this is what speaks when God, when the Lord Jesus spoke, he spoke about the ark or about the law in one, two words. Love God. And love your neighbor as yourself. And brethren, the only thing that we will sing and burst of praise 
through the endless ages of eternity is that this blessed one, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the one who loved God and who loved us to the measure that he gave his life for us. That's why when the ark crested, the only thing that remained in it were the two tables of stones. Because it speaks of love. You know, when you take it by way of type and you look in the scripture, these three things that were in the ark speaks of faith, hope, and love. These three shall abide, 1 Corinthians 13. But the greatest of them all is what? Is love. Because faith will be replaced with sight. Trust me, dear brethren, let's live by faith here. You're not going to live by faith in heaven. So many of us, we panic about everything. Where is the confidence? Where is the faith we have in God? We're not going to enjoy it in heaven. We're going to enjoy it here. So you might enjoy this wonderful principle of faith that God has given us. So faith and there is hope that we love to see him. We love to be in his presence. But when we are ushered into heaven, there is no more hope. There is no more faith. There is no more hope. What remains? Love. And this is the only thing that will ever rest in the heart of the Lord Jesus. That he is the one who loved God and he is the one who loved men. And this wonderful song of the redemptive love of Christ will occupy the saints of God eternally. This is the wonderful thing about Christ. But when it comes to men, some people would say Joseph was the most closest type of the Lord Jesus without any failure. I dare to say, I don't accept it. Joseph had one thing that brought him short of the type. And I like it this way. Believe me, brother, I like it this way. I don't like to see anyone as a man being a perfect type of Christ because there's always something short. Where was the shortage of Joseph? Joseph, in every way he behaved, you would say, wow, this man is like the Lord Jesus. He is a perfect type. Brethren, he was almost a perfect type. The only thing that Joseph missed was discerning the mind of God in blessing. You still remember when Jacob wanted to bless his children. And Jacob said, he said, listen, let me bless the children. And he, how did he bless them? You remember? Young ones, do you know how he blessed Jacob, how he blessed his children? Crossed his arms. He blessed the young one more than the, the old one. But he blessed on the foundation of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Think of it for a moment. That when Jacob blessed his children, he could have easily blessed them this way, right? We will bless this way. We would lift our arms and bless if you want to bless. But when it came to the source of blessing and the foundation of every blessing that mankind would receive, it can only come on one ground and one ground alone. And that ground is the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. No wonder that the scripture tells us that Jacob crossed his arms and blessed them. Joseph did not understand the mind of God. He says, let it not be so, my father. Let it not be so, my father. He said, you sit, son. I love it. It reminds me of Naomi with Ruth. Sit, my daughter, sit. For the man shall not rest. For the man shall not rest. Until... He fulfills it. Brethren, Christ will not rest until you and I are home. Are home. How wonderful. So, God brings different men and different women. Brings them into the scene so that we can know more of the greatness of the Lord Jesus. One of them is Solomon. Solomon is a unique personality. He speaks about the Lord Jesus as the one who shall reign supreme over this earth. Solomon comes from the word peace, Suleiman. It brings from the thought and the foundation of peace. You see, everything that God has given the people of God was always related to peace. You know that? You might say, Brother John, clear it out before you. When he has chosen a city... He chose a city by the name of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem means, the word of Jerusalem means double peace. Well, you would say, well, why would God occupy us with double peace? Well, peace has a double meaning. 
And what God wants us to anticipate is when, we, when he comes to reign supreme as the prince of peace, he's going to be occupied with the earthly Jerusalem and you and I will be the heavenly Jerusalem. But it is the foundation on the double peace. What's the double T peace? Peace is always speaks of two things. The absence of enmity. Brethren, look at this. When we are ushered into glory, there will be a complete absence of enmity. There is no sin. That's why I read Revelation 21. There is no sin. There is no death. There is no devil. There is no Satan. There is no you and I with the fleshly activity. There is nothing. It's the absence of enmity. But the double peace, as far as Jerusalem is concerned, it is not only the absence of enmity. It is the presence of harmony. And that's what peace is all about. And that's why it's a good thing for the brethren to dwell together in unity. And when the Apostle Paul spoke to the saints at Corinthians, he said, live at peace. So that the saints of God are expected to live here on earth the way we can live up there in glory. I told you last time what one of these early brethren, chief brothers amongst the brethren said. To dwell above with the saints I love, it will be all glory. To dwell below with the saints I know, it's a different story. And sometimes it is real, it is true, it's a different story. But brethren, we are exhorted in the word of God to live at peace. So that we can enjoy the harmony that we can have with one another. That's why I love David. It was said of David that he plays the harp. And when we read the scripture that there is playing of the harp, the harp speaks of harmony. And there will be wonderful thing when we attend local testimonies or when you come to a local testimony and you recognize and you see that there is a perfect harmony amongst the saints of God. Nothing like it. It's a foretaste of heaven. But Solomon was based on this. He will come as the prince of peace and he reigns supreme. So God said, listen, when Solomon was ushered into the scene, the scripture says, and God, now think of that, brethren. Please try to understand what I'm trying to convey to you. It was said about Solomon that God has greatly and exceedingly magnified him above all. Now think of these words. Exceedingly magnified him above all. That's Solomon. That's Solomon. Solomon, God has magnified him exceedingly. More than anybody else. Well, if he did this to a man, if God did this to Solomon, what do you think he will do for his son? I will dare... To, oh, dear brother, you left it open. Thank you. I needed a shower. Yes. What would he do to his son? I always like to suggest to my brethren that God will move the universe to make his son supreme. He will shake the, the universe. And that's why the earth is shaken. Why? He is preparing the scene that his son will rule supreme. We talked yesterday. We were having great fun about Gaddafi and about this guy and about that guy. But there's coming a day. There's going to be one that will reign supreme over all nations. And just let one rise their ugly head about, against him. Just one. One person. Let him raise his ugly head against my Lord and Savior. He will be dealt with immediately. You tell these things in our, in our times, in a world of democracy, you say this is not humane. Well, you know what? What do you mean? God has set his holy, upon his holy Zion, his cornerstone. He has set up a king. And there is a king that will reign supreme in this world. If you are without the Lord Jesus, I'm still going to exhort you another occasion, another period that God is extending his love to you. And God is extending his grace to you. Today, if you heard my voice, harden not your heart. Today is the day of salvation. That's what the scripture says. So today, this afternoon is a day of salvation. Don't postpone it anymore. Don't put it on the shelf because God has appointed his king to rule over Zion. And the Lord Jesus is going to come soon. And he's going to reign supreme. And if you are without the Lord Jesus Christ, even this afternoon, the moment is coming. If he shall come right now 
and bring us home. Take us all in rapture. You will be left behind. And I want to tell you, don't waste yourself with too much junk in the market amongst Christ Christian literature. There is a book and there is a movie that came a few years back. Second chance. And I want to tell you, God has given you a million chance right now. But if Christ will come, even this moment, to bring us home, you will not have a second chance. You will not have a second chance. You thank God that he's given you a million chances. Every second of every minute of your life, consider it as a chance from God for you to be saved. And you are still sitting day after day, Lord's day after Lord's day, coming with your parents or coming to attend the meeting. And deep inside in your own soul, you haven't made a commitment for Christ. And what do you think is going to happen when the day of judgment shall come? He is going to ask you, what have you done with my son? I offered my son and you rejected him. Now I reject you. But the time is here that I can accept the love of God. For the scripture says... For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, period. My dear friend, if you will trust Christ, he will grant you eternal security. That the scripture says they are all in his hand and not only in his hand but in the hand of my father. So just imagine what kind of security God has given each one of us that we are secured eternally. All you have to do is trust him. All you have to do is bow the knee for him today. And once you bow the knee for him today, you are his and you are his eternally. Solomon is the king of peace. And the scripture says, God magnified him exceedingly above all others. And if God have magnified a man in such a way, just imagine with me what God will do for his beloved son. And I'm going to bring the types. He made the throne. And it says he made a throne and the king made a great throne. I dare to say that what God has in mind for that great throne is none other but the Lord Jesus Christ. Solomon made a great throne, but after that he went downhill. He started going after strange women and so many things and so many. He destroyed the type. He came short of the type. But when God was moving the heart of Solomon, he made a throne of ivory and the scripture says it was a great throne. No wonder Solomon was the one who wrote the uh, uh, three books. Solomon brought, wrote three books. He wrote the book of Proverbs. He wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. He wrote the book of Song of Songs. Listen. Have you ever considered why do we call it the song of songs? Because it speaks of Christ Jesus. Everything that relates to Christ, he's got the supremacy of it. It is said that Solomon made a thousand and five songs. Thousand and You know what I always ask? Which one of us have sat down and so she was so or she was so overwhelmed with Christ? That he or she wrote a poem about Christ. Solomon wrote a thousand and five songs. But that song was the song of songs. What relates to Christ takes supremacy. There are kings on earth. But the Lord Jesus is the king of kings. There are lords on earth. But the Lord Jesus is the Lord of Lords. And there are songs that are sang in this world. But the song of Christ is the song of songs. But he is the one who made a great throne. Listen, brethren, everything that Christ has done takes character from his person. Let's support that from scripture. Everything that Christ done takes character from his person. Everything that relates to Christ Jesus in the word of God, it is called to be great. For example, in Matthew chapter 1, when he was born, he says, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. But in the gospel of Luke, it was different. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, 
for he shall be great. You see? For he shall be great. There were shepherds in the scriptures. There was Moses, there was Joseph, there was David, you name it. Great men of faith. But when it came to the Lord Jesus, he wasn't only a good shepherd. He wasn't only a normal shepherd. But when we go to the book of Hebrews chapter 13, he was what? The great shepherd. It takes character from his person. Aaron was a wonderful high priest. He was a wonderful high priest in his time. But when it came to the Lord Jesus, he was not only a high priest. But the book of Hebrews calls him, we have a great high priest. It adds the word of greatness to his wonderful offices because it takes character from his blessed person. Even the work of salvation. Listen, there were other men that have delivered the people of God. Moses was the deliverer in the sight of, in the, sight of the nation of Israel. And he delivered them. It says, and I delivered you from Egypt. And God used somebody like Moses. But when it came to the work of salvation of Christ Jesus, it says in the book of Hebrews, how shall we escape if we neglect what? So great salvation. Everything that belongs to Christ is considered great. And my dear brethren, this morning for these few moments, it is my desire to engage in our hearts with the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who sits upon the throne presently. This morning we have remembered what he has done on Calvary's cross. We have remembered the price of atonement. We have remembered how he was thrown into a grave where no man was there. We know why. That there should be no man in that grave. Do we know why? The Lord Jesus when he was buried... It was of necessity that he was buried in a place where no man was laid there before. Do we know why? I'm going to tell you why. It was of necessity that that grave was never touched with another dead body. Because God wants to show openly that even if man said, Okay, we believe that he was raised like the old man during the days of Elisha. He was brought to be buried. His bones touched the bones of Elijah and he was revived. So if there was another man in that grave, people will take the same argument. People would say, well, okay, if he was raised, then his bones must have touched the bones of a prophet. God said, no, 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 no. I'm going to take this argument away and I'm going to put my son in a grave where no man was ever there before. That's why was Christ buried there. But he was buried and raised on the third day, seated on the throne presently. And this great white throne that Solomon has made, it was set made out of what? Ivory. What does ivory speak to you? Ivory in the scriptures speaks of death. When you wanted to obtain ivory in the older days, that animal was put to death to obtain the, bright, to, to obtain the ivory. And the one who's got the right to sit upon the throne... Not any normal man. Not any kind of man. The one who's got the right to sit upon the throne is none other but the one who went through death. And when we go and look toward heaven, there is a hymn we sing in hymn number 98. Gazing on thee, Lord in glory, while our hearts in worship bow. When we look toward glory, we see one that sits upon the throne. Not only as a blessed God, but he sits upon the throne as a blessed man as well. He has every right to sit upon it because of two things. The greatness of his person and the greatness of his work. And when Solomon built that great throne, it said it was out of what? Ivory. It was out of a place of death. And the Lord Jesus is the one who went through death and have full victory over death. And now he's got the right to sit upon the throne supreme above all. And that throne, it says it has six steps. And when you consider the six steps, it speaks to us about the birth of Christ. 
about when Christ was 12 years old, about when Christ was 30 years old, about when Christ died on Calvary's cross, about when Christ was buried, and about when Christ was ascended. There are six steps in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a throne out of ivory with six steps. And every step we take, dear brethren, because we're, we've told what? Let us approach the throne of grace. We have the right toward the throne. There is the throne of grace. There is the throne of glory. Amen to it. But we have the right to enter into the throne. So let us in boldness approach the throne of grace. So as we taking steps toward the throne, one step is to consider the birth of this blessed man. As I said yesterday, there was never anyone that was ushered into this world that was born a king. There was nobody that was still in his mother's womb that was called upon that baby, my Lord. You remember that? When the Lord Jesus was in the womb of Mary, Elizabeth, she would say when Mary came to Elizabeth, Elizabeth will hear that her, her child, John the Baptist, leaped. And right away she said, who am I? That the mother of my Lord. Dear brethren, what a blessed person. That there is a godly woman that considered the Lord Jesus from the womb. Still in the womb of Mary. He was my Lord. He was my Lord. Just from the womb. And for us as Christians, he is high, exalted, seated on the throne. And we don't know the value of his lordship in my life. We do whatever we want to do. We forget that we are bought with a price. Our bodies are not our own. We have a Lord to answer to. We do whatever we want to do. Elizabeth considered this blessed baby in Mary's womb. He was my Lord. Who am I? The mother of my Lord. When Mary and Magdala went to the cross, she was looking for a dead person. And she told the, 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 uh, the, uh, the gardener, they have taken away what? My Lord. Well, Mary, who, who's your Lord? He's a dead person. No, no, no. Dead or in the womb, he is my Lord. And as I said before, we take his Lordship very lightly. His birth was so tremendous to this earth that the universe never witnessed a man like this man. A man like this man was never seen before. It was said now the second step in the way he lived as a 12 years old, sitting in the midst of the scribes. And he says they were amazed with the questions and with what? He didn't only ask questions. You know, he asked questions. Young people, listen. The Lord Jesus, when he was 12 years old, he was setting an example for a 12-year-old individual. Whether you are a boy or a girl, ask questions. Questions are good. The Lord Jesus, as a 12-year-old, he asked questions, but not only he asked the questions, but he also answered the questions. And you follow the steps of the Lord Jesus as a young man, it says, and he subjected himself to Mary and Joseph. Listen, young ones, I tell you like my own children, we're living in a world that the world encourages the children, you know what, don't let your father, your mother slap you one. One time, my son did something. I said, come talk to me. So when they say, when daddy says to them, come talk to me, they know. Says, my son would say, can't we talk here, dad? I said, no, talk to me. So we go upstairs. And I had to do what I had to do. Barbecue, a little barbecue. You know? So a week after that, he comes home. And he says, well, I was in school, Dad, and they were talking about diapers. Diapers. Diapers? It's called diapers? You call people when... Uh... I said, that's fine. Three months later, something happened. I just slapped him on the hand. I said, don't you ever do this on my table. And by the way, here's the number of diapers, if you want to call them. <laughs> diapers? What is this? The world is trying to encourage our children... To live the way they want to live. To do the things they want to do. But when the Lord Jesus was 12 years old. The scripture says. And he subjected himself to Mary and Joseph. He was an obedient son. And in the scripture you children. Yeah, yeah, you can smile and give me a smirk. 
But in the scripture, when the scripture says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Let me, let me tell you. You ready for the reasons why? Let me give you the reasons. A list of reasons. For this is right. Period. There's no reason to give you. Well, uh, dad, uh, why can't I do this? Because you can't. The scripture never said, children, obey your parents because, 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 because. There's no reason. He says, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. So don't ask your parents for excuses and why this and why not. The Lord Jesus, the second step, the way he lived as a 12 years old, he was a remarkable child that he was subject to the demands of his mother, Mary, and of Joseph. By the way, the scripture says about Mary that she was his mother. Always in the scripture, she was referred his mother. But never ever in the scripture, the Lord Jesus called her my mother. In the scripture, the Lord Jesus called her woman. Woman. And that's wonderful to notice that. Because he is supreme above all. He is supreme above all. And if he called Mary one time my mother, then forget it. Without calling her my mother, and we have a big headache. Right? Without calling her my mother, we have big headache. Just imagine if he called her one time my mother. It will be a double headache. How about like when he lived here 30 years old, went about doing good. This guy has leprosy, he will clean. What a blessed man. Then he goes to death. And this in Calvary's cross, he will die in a way that is different. And the scripture says he was crucified in the midst of two malefactors. Listen, the Lord Jesus is always in the midst. Even in his death, he was in the midst. When the saints are gathered, where is he? He's in the midst. That's it. When he went to glory, where is he? The scripture says he sits in the midst of the throne. And how about the 24 elders? It says he sits in the midst of the 24 elders. Listen, that's his rightful place. He will ever remain the center of attraction. There will nobody will take the place of Christ in the midst as being the center of attraction. And then he goes to death and then the grave. The fifth step. God raised him from the death. And the sixth step, where is he? He's up in heaven. And it says that there was by that throne, great white throne, that the one who's got the right to sit upon it is the one who went through death. And it says there were six lions on one side and six lions on the other side. By the steps, there were 12 lions. You know what the 12 speaks of? We were talking about 12 apostles and 12 tribes. And the 12 minor prophets. And I want to tell you, that number 12 is unique in the scripture. You go to the New Jerusalem, there were 12 angels, 12 stones. It's a wonderful number, but it speaks about administration. Number speaks of administration or distribution. And listen, dear brethren, from that throne where Christ occupies, he has led captivity captive. And he was ascended on high and he gave men gifts. Who gives the gifts? It's the administrator himself. He is the one who distributes gifts according to what he sees fit. And I'm going to encourage young and older like, listen, there is no one believer under heaven that Christ Jesus did not give him or her a measure of faith. That is to say a gift for them to exercise until he comes. And the other thing to clarify is prayer is not a gift. It's a privilege of every believer. But gift, he has given each one of us a certain gift. Where do our gifts come from? Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 12, the Father. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Spirit of God. Ephesians 4, it is the Lord Jesus himself. But in every portion about the gift, the scripture says, and he has given every one of us a certain gift. Let's start dealing and exercising these gifts. Let's not be a spectators. 
We come to conferences, we sit back, we sit on the side or we sit whatever and we let others do the work. Listen, there is the gift of what? Of he that giveth. Do you know that there are some people that are more givers than others? You can tell me 10% and you can tell me 15%. It doesn't matter. We don't go with percentage with God. We go with what God has prospered us. That's what 1 Corinthians 16 tells us. But we don't go with percentage. We go with whatever God has prospered us. But one of the gifts in Romans chapter 12, he that giveth. There are those that are gifted in giving. Brethren will give a thousand. There is a heart. This guy has a gift that God used him to give two thousand or three, whatever it is. It's a gift. But all what I'm trying to say is let us use these gifts that God has given us because they come from the throne. They come from the administrator who sits upon the throne. He gives gifts to men. He gives gifts to the saints of God so that the body of Christ might be built up and we can reach into the stature of Christ. Why do the gifts are given? So that you and I, Ephesians tells us, we can come into the stature of Christ. So that the body of Christ will be able to reflect the head, which is Christ Jesus. It brings me back to the thought of what? Conformity. You know, these gifts, they're all given, brother and sister, to help one another. So that people will see Christ in me. People will see Christ in you. This is the one who sits upon the throne. When we go to Isaiah, he had a wonderful vision, but I wanted to read a little bit about the kings. He lived about four generations. He lived under four different kings. He says over here in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Interesting, I would say. He has seen four different kings. And every king needs much help. Uzziah. Uzziah's problem was he was a good king. He started very good. But his problem, it got to his head. It got to his head. He said, I'm a king only. I want to be a priest. Uzziah was a king now listen carefully, please. He wanted to take away from the greatness of Christ. And I'm going to tell you why. He was a king of Judah. He said, me only king? No way. I only have one gift. I only have one gift. Are you out of your mind? I am too good to get only one gift. I need many gifts. Hezekiah said, listen, I am a king. But then he went into a temple, into the temple of the Lord, and he brought the censer, right? He wanted to act as a priest. What happens? Leprosy hits him right in the head, and he remained leprous till the end of his life. Listen, dear brethren, there is no one ever. Let me repeat that. There is no one ever will sit upon the throne as a king and a priest other than one blessed person, and that is Christ Jesus, our Lord. And this king, a man, wanted to be a king and wanted to be a, a priest and sits upon the throne. There were people that were kings and they were thrown, but they never sat on a throne. Moses was a king, was a priest, was a prophet, was all these offices, but he never sat on a throne. He was always a man that is walking in the wilderness. He never entered into the land. There is only one blessed great man that will ever occupy the throne as a king and as a priest from the book of Zechariah chapter 6 that he shall sit upon his throne as a king and what? And as a priest. Uzziah said, I want to be king and priest. And God said, you want it? You want to take the place of my son, brethren? It's a serious thing when somebody in a local testimony will have a desire to take the place of the Lord Jesus Christ and tell the saints what they need to do. No one in the sight of heaven can take the place of Christ. God would remove them from the scene. Yesterday we were talking about every time we elevate a man and we put man on a pedal stool and we make much of this man. God said, oh, I see. You know what? It reminds me of that verse in Psalm 2. God who, who sitteth above, 
laughs. God laughs when he sees that man is making much of man. We put them on a pedal stool and we exalt them. And God said, oh yeah, yeah, you're exalting them. Let me show you what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring them down. And Uzziah started as a good king. But at the end of his life, he said, well, I am too good to only be king. I want to be king and priest. And God said, no way. No way that there will be ever a man that will sit upon my throne as king and priest. But my beloved son, the Lord Jesus. And this man lived with leprosy the rest of his life. It hit him here in the, in, the, in the mind. It hit him here where all his thoughts, the thoughts of pride, the thoughts of elevation, the thoughts that I am better than anybody were completely destroyed in the sight of God. That's the King Josiah. Isaiah lived in such a time. We're living in a time where the attitude of mankind is we are better than anybody. I can do whatever I want to do. There is a certain pride in every man and every woman. And in the sight of God, there is no pride. God hates the proud. And Uzziah wanted to take a place that didn't belong to him. And God said, no, 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 I'm going to give you my answer. You have leprosy. You will be gone from the scene because only my beloved son sits upon the throne as king and as priest. That's the first one. The second one was Jotham. He was a good king, but in his time, it says, he never entered into the temple of the Lord. So his father was bold enough, right? See, his father was bold enough that he wanted to go into the very inner temple and act as a priest. But Jotham, he says, he didn't go to the temple. Although he had the right to go to the temple, you can go to the temple and offer a sacrifice, right? You could do that. But he decided, oh, my father exceeded. He went too far. I'm not going to go to the temple. He is a spirit that is amongst the people of God in our days that we say, I am not going to the meeting because there is nothing in the meeting that will meet my needs. It is everything about I, myself, and me. Why is it that it is about your need? Why is it about your need? Why can it be about the person? Why can it be about the Lord Jesus? Why is it about you? And you go to certain meetings and, and you will say, well, where are the saints of God? Why aren't they coming out? Well, you know, you talk to a young man. Well, I, you know what? There's nothing for me. What do you mean there's nothing for you? What do you want them to do? To play something for you? To dance for you? What is it that there's nothing for me? Meetings is not about you. The gathering of the saints, dear brethren, let's say it very plainly and simply. It's not about you. It is about the Lord Jesus. So Jotham, he said, I'm not going to go to the temple anymore. Because the experience that I have witnessed is awful. I'm not going to the temple. And what an excuse we give the saints of God. We say over the history that oh, with all my experience that I have seen amongst the brethren, I don't want to go there. Look at all what they did. Look at all the cause. Look at all the havoc that was caused. Listen, you are fooling yourself. It is only an excuse in the sight of heaven. We are encouraging the word of God, not forsaking the assembling of one another. We are encouraged to be in the meeting. We are encouraged to be in the Bible study. We are encouraged to be in the prayer meeting. And stop giving excuses why you cannot be at meetings. Jotham was man, was a king that said, oh, I'm not going to go there anymore. And the scripture says, in his days, the people corrupted themselves. It's an awful thing. What kind of legacy are we going to leave, brethren? What's the legacy we're leaving behind? You know what it says about Abel in Hebrews chapter 11? It says, though, listen to this now carefully. Though he is dead, yet he speaketh. Though he is dead, but yet till our days, he still speaks. He has a testimony that's affecting mankind. The first man in the chapter of faith is this man. The first man is this man. But he speaks. He left a legacy that he honored the Lord with the way he sacrificed. What kind of legacy we're leaving behind? Am I going to be a Jotham? That in the days where God has placed me in my local testimony, that the people of God are going to corrupt themselves? The third king, he was bad. Ezra. It says he started 
doing the things of the Gentiles. What were the things of the Gentiles? He says when you read about his record, is he made his sons, he threw his sons in the fire like the Gentiles. This man has no concern for the next generation. This man had no concern about the next generation. He was willing to destroy the next generation for him to be happy. Brethren, we have to have concern for the next generation. We have to provide them with that which is suitable for them to be in the right condition at the right meeting. We have to care for the next generation. And the last king was Hezekiah and he said, listen, I want peace. He, his heart was lifted up at the end of the days. He was a good king. He started boasting about all his riches. He thought he has done it all. You remember Hezekiah, what happens to him? He prayed and he did not accept the will of God. Let me give you that. Are you an individual who's going to accept the will of God in your life, whatever it is? It was said about Hezekiah that the prophet came to him and he told him what? He said, listen, man, your time came. Make, prepare yourself. Your time has come. Probably we'll all be like Hezekiah. But you know what? The scripture never spoke about Jana Jami. He spoke about Hezekiah. So we'll talk about Hezekiah. Probably we'll all be like him. Lord, come on. Let me see my daughter getting married. You know, something like this. When his time came, he said, Hezekiah, get ready, my friend. You're going to die. And Hezekiah, it says, he goes before the Lord. Look at this. He reminds him. He's reminding God. Of all the things that he has done for him. Brethren, we have to remind God of what we have done for him. And God looked at him and says, okay, you want to live longer? Are you reminding me? I'm going to let you live longer. You're going to live how many? 15 years. And God said, I'm going to show you something, Hezekiah. And during this 15 years, he gave him a son by the name of Manasseh. And Manasseh was one of the most wicked kings that the nation have ever witnessed. Brethren, submit to the will of God. Don't resist it. Don't go against it. Because God will allow certain things to take place. And then you will find out, ah! Oh, how did I go against God's will? And it was said about Isaiah that he entered into the presence of God. And it was after the death of Uzziah. When man is set aside, we can enter and we can see Christ. You know, so many times we don't see the Lord Jesus. We don't enjoy the Lord Jesus simply because there is so much of man seen in the meeting. The reason we don't see Christ is because we see other men. You remember when the Lord Jesus opened the eyes of the blind in the book of Mark? It says he opened, he touched his hands and he says, what do you see? It's a moral lesson for us. It's a tremendous lesson. He says, what do you see? What do you think? The Lord couldn't open his eyes the first time? You think that the Lord could open his eyes just like that? Absolutely. But he said, I'm going to open your eyes in two ways. He says, open your eyes. What do you see? He says, I see men as trees walking. You see men? You are seeing men? Well, wait a second. Let me give you another touch. He touched and he saw man. He saw one man. He saw no one save Jesus only. Brethren, the reason that sometimes we don't see Christ is because we are occupied much with other men. And once we set man aside, we can see clearly the Lord Jesus. You know what was said about Psalm 132? When David was looking for the ark, we're almost finished dear brethren. I still have an hour, but we're almost there. But when, Christ, when, when he saw looking for the ark, he says, and we have found it. Look what he says. huh? The original translation says, and we have found it from the clearing of the woods. Where did he find the ark? From the what? Clearing of the woods. When he cleared the woods that speaks of man, when he starts setting man aside, he starts having a clear vision to see where the ark is. And brethren, when we set man aside, we can have a clear visions of Christ. Set man aside. Man is nobody.
Today he lives, tomorrow he dies. But there remaineth a man that sits upon the throne. And the second thing that when I'm ushered into the presence of the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, he says, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne high and lifted up. High because of whom he is. You remember what the devil wanted to do? He says, I wanted to lift his seat above the throne of God. He wanted to be very high. Why? Because he is high. High because of the greatness of his person. But lifted up. You see, there's a difference. High because of who he is. Lifted up because of who he became. He is lifted up and God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. Listen, Joseph was a type of Christ. David was a type of Christ. The ark was a type of Christ. Moses was a type of Christ. Aaron was a type of Christ. But I love when it comes to that verse in Philippians chapter 2 that God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus... Every knee shall bow. Not those in heaven, not those on earth. Trust me, dear brethren. Those that are under the earth. The millions of people that are perishing every day. That have spat in the face of my Lord. That have crucified the Lord of glory. Every knee underneath the earth shall bow the knee. Satan can go and mingle and do and whatever. And all the spiritual wickedness, they can be used by the enemy to cause havoc amongst the people of God. But there is coming a day where all the spiritual wickedness and mankind and the hatred that they had for God and that they had for this wonderful beloved man, they will bow the knee in hell and they will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. My dear friend, the invitation remains the same this afternoon. Bow the knee today or else the day will be coming when you will bow the knee to my Lord and to my Savior. Willingly or unwillingly, you will. You will. You will. You will. Bow the knee. Do it today. The throne is a wonderful theme, brethren, but I have to cut it short. But I'm going to close with this. The first thought about the throne in the Bible was in relationship to Joseph. And that's why I want to close with Joseph. Joseph, if you remember, he had dreams. He was a man of dreams. But what did he dream? What were the dreams of Joseph? Like I said, Philippians chapter 2, right? He dreamed... That the stars are what? Bowing to him. And he dreamed that in the field, all this, you call it, what, what, what do you like? Wheat? What would you like? Whatever. They are bowing to him. God will make sure that everything is going to bow to who? To Christ Jesus. But the throne, the first time the throne was mentioned was in Genesis chapter 45. When Pharaoh told Joseph, listen. I will be greater than thou by sitting upon the throne. And if you know what is greatness, dear brethren, you look upon the throne today and you see a blessed one. And as I'm ushered into the throne, I see greatness. We have a hymn that speaks about, oh, about the holiest of all. The merits of the Lord appear. They fill the holy place. That's all what we see when we are ushered into the throne. I see the end of man. Uzziah died. But I see the end of myself. Woe! Woe unto me. My dear brother, my dear sister, you need help with your thoughts. You need help with your pride. You need help with whatever things you are thinking. You usher yourself into the throne of God. And when you see the glory of Christ, you would know that man is nothing. You will know that you are nothing. Woe! Unto me, he says. Whoa. And the last scripture we have read. He that sits upon the throne. Says, I will make all things. All things new. But the scripture says. In the beginning, that's the eternal day. And I make new heavens. And a new earth. And there shall be no more sea. You know where the sea speaks of, right? Sea speaks of two things in the scripture. Separation 
and restlessness. That we're going to be ushered into a place, dear brethren, and that time is coming soon. When we shall be at perfect rest in his presence. Perfect rest. Nothing will interrupt it. Nothing will change it. Nothing will touch it. Perfect rest. And there's no more separation. No more separation from our Savior. And no more separation from our loved ones. I love to be there. Looking forward to be there. The question is, are you? Do you hear his words afresh? I will make all things new. When he spoke on Calvary's cross, he said, It is finished. But when he brings me into totally new creation, he said, It is done. The work is done. And what I like about the eternal day and eternity is we are never told in the scripture what eternity will be about. We are never told how we're going to function when we are ushered into the eternal day of God, right? We're never told. There isn't anything in the scripture. In fact, Paul says that there are things that are impossible, hard for man to utter. It's impossible to explain. I cannot explain it. It's impossible. And for what he saw, he got a thorn in the flesh. For what he saw, he got a thorn in the flesh, lest I be exalted. But all what the scripture tells me, the tender, blessed Savior of ours, the one who loved us and gave himself for us, he says, listen, I'm going to make all things new. And all what he tells us that will be through the endless ages of eternity, he shall wipe those tears away. He shall wipe those tears away. Just think of the tears of the saints of God for whatever they are. The tears of the condition, the tears of a lost loved one, the tears of the circumstances, the tears of persecution, the tears of suffering. Whatever tears that the saints of God are going through. The tender loving master that have created all things new. I dare to say he will do it tenderly, taking every tear of ours. And say, don't cry anymore. No longer. No more to shed a tear. No more to cry. No more death. No more sin. And what will occupy us through the endless ages of eternity? To see that blessed one. And what we will see is the marks of his hands, his side, and feet. And with these signs, we will understand the depth of his love, how much he loved me, that he took these wounds eternally. I will see them eternally, all his wounds. I will see these wounds eternally. And I will understand just for a bit how much he loved me, how much he loved you. And join with the hymn writer, oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. What a blessed Savior we have, dear brethren. He is on the throne. He occupies the throne. And that will be our eternal occupation with him that left the throne. I want to see loved ones. I want to see loved ones. I want to see my Lord. And I want to see loved ones. And there are young parents. I'm going to tell you my desire before the Lord. If the Lord would allow me to say something. I want to be able to say. What Christ will say. You know when Christ will present us before the Father. What he would say. He says I. And the children. Whom thou hast given me. I brought them all home. I like to say the same. Young parents, don't give up on your children. I want to be able to say to my Lord, I and the children whom thou hast given me, we're coming home. We're coming home. Are you ready to go home? I'll close with this. When Judah 
was speaking to Joseph and he whispered in his ears. You know what he told him? He was making a case for Benjamin. He said, please, please let Benjamin go back to his father. But you know what he whispers in his ears? He says, how could I go to my father without the lad? And brethren, how could we go to glory without our own children? May the Lord give us mercy and grace and patience and to be occupied with the throne right now and make much of the one who occupies it. And when we reach home, I might be standing next to Brother Sidi and we will tell one another, listen, the half has not been told and may it be so for his name's sake.